Because I guess engineering can be a bit kind of, you know, black box sometimes, and people don't really understand why you've made that decision. Episode 136. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week we visit a podcast that was actually recorded in a pre-COVID time, if you can remember that. And uh, I had the good fortune to visit Peter Corbett, who is the co-founder, along with David Tasker, of Corbett & Tasker, who are a designed, focused, structural engineering practice. And uh, I spent the afternoon in Peter's studio amongst the team and um, I've actually had the good fortune to work with Peter on a number of projects. And I've always been incredibly impressed with their approach, their creativity and their expertise and the way that they can bring a project together and they really understand the aesthetic and design vision of the architect. Um, in this episode, Peter and I discuss the growth of Corbett and Tasker. We talk about what it's like to work with architects and how to deal with clients. So sit back, relax and enjoy Peter Corbett. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, Please follow the link in the information. Peter. Ryan. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for inviting me on. My pleasure. Good to see you. and Good to be here in your office. And, you know, we've known each other for a, a few years. We have. And it's been quite... And we've worked together on a number of projects. We have. And you're officially the first engineer to be on the Business of Architecture UK. So I think that's, that's a special... A special accolade. I am honoured. I'm very honoured. Especially yeah. for you. Yeah, no, thank you, Ryan. Thanks for inviting and, me on. And it's, it's really good because I'm, you know, I've seen from, a, from, a, from an outside perspective the kind of, you know, you, what you've been doing, the growth mm. of your practice. And for me, Corbett and Tasker, was, uh, there's a lot of similarities to a design-led architectural practice. And your, your work, for example, is, you know, it's, it's got a design focus to it. There's, mm. there's a, a sort of, uh, a reverence to being able to show off or showcase or mm. demonstrate beautiful engineering, which mm. is a kind of very sort of architectural component to it. Um, and you've got a really interesting sort of portfolio of work. You've sort of pioneering um, sort of wood and timber techniques and yeah. in engineering, and you've got a sort of a niche in, in, in the world of chapels and spiritual buildings as well as working on a number of commercial and residential stuff. Yeah, somehow we have managed to build up those, all those things that you say and more. So uh, I suppose the, the first question is, how did, how did you and David come together? How did the, the practice begin? Okay, yeah, so, um, well, David and I know each other both personally and professionally and worked together over many years at uh, larger practices. Um, and we were quite interested in, you know, if you really strip back um, an engineering practice back to its kind of simplest form, yeah. um, you know, what that might look like. Um, and when we left our, um, you know, previous company, that was really the kind of at the ethos, yeah, you know, really the heart of of, of what what we we're trying to do. Um, so we're both very different people, look at the same thing in very different ways, um, yet somehow the kind of motivation or the, the kind of purpose, the driver, um, is very similar, yeah. I would say. And um, that, I think, is you know, a, real, a, real, a real strength. And what were, the, what were the sort of the early projects that you started to take on? Was it a case of there were things that you were working on in your previous practice or mm. previous company that you were like, you know, we could, we could replicate doing that ourselves or? There was as certainly aspects of that. And um, we 
I think, well, I personally feel very fortunate throughout my career to have worked on some pretty amazing projects with mm. some really amazing people. Um, we were working with a, um, a church group, um, a religious group called the Christian Community um, over many years. And um, we've done a number, of, a series of chapels with them. And um, so our first project was um, a timber chapel. Each, each chapel we were doing them getting slightly bigger, yeah. different, and, and um, but there were some, some similarities. Um, and this particular chapel, um, timber, it was, a, it was a, going to be a timber, a timber structure, panelized, complex geometry, um, and really in the kind of finest tradition of um, religious architecture, there was a kind of structural honesty to it. Yeah. Um, and what it was made of, how it stands up, is also how you, what you see and yeah. how you experience the space. Um, and so we were, so that was our, our first, uh, first commission as we started. Um, and uh, yeah, there's various things which have kind of come out of that and other Mm. links and relationships that we built um and uh yeah that was really the the kind of starting groove if you like and uh, to corporate and tasker and and how how are you go about winning work and, and, and mm. am i am i right to sort of make the comparison to an architectural practice or do you think there are similarities between arch, like the kind of architectural practices that you work with and your own company there are similarities yes i think um, well, I think a lot of our work is quite kind of visual, yeah. Um, and uh, the images, be they kind of design, development, drawings, models, sketches, or the final, or the thing being built on site, mm. or, or, or the final shots once it's um, once it's constructed, there is a, um, a very kind of visual, strong visual quality. Often the structures are very legible. Um, and I think that does mean that we're kind of there's a similar language there with architectural practices yeah. and what kind of motivates um, an architect or designer. I mean, I, I think whilst there is obviously that that distinction, I mean, some of our um, some of our best projects, I think that there's been a real blurring of the line between. Um, what's the architecture and what's the structure. Yeah. Um, so there is, yes, you are, you are right to uh, kind of draw that kind of parallel, but not, uh, we are, obviously when we're working side by side, there are kind of distinct roles. Yeah. Um, and uh, that's the same, I think, for any engineering yeah. practice, you know. Um, I think very important as well that we're not just kind of switched on by the kind of idea and the kind of visuals but also by the the detail um, how it's built mm -hmm. and the buildability aspects um, and with the, the kind of the execution of it um, and the realization of that idea how, how do you how do you create or facilitate a kind of successful design relationship with other consultants and namely mm. you know, the architects what 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 are the key components there for for that being a good a good, a good relationship yeah. well there's got to be real trust i think and mm. um, also kind of clarity about what it is that we're trying to trying to achieve um kind of respect uh, a relationship built on respect and and trust really um, I mean, people come to us for all sorts of reasons, all different stages of the project, and sometimes it is kind of quite straightforward, and we kind of know what we want, and it just has to, um, you know, it's, it's, it is the way it is, yeah. and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, that's, there's, a, there's a very noble role for the engineer to play there. Um, I would say we, you know, are greater strength there is when we could also be involved in what that concept yeah. that we are realizing uh, can we can you know real foot if we can play a role in that mm. kind of ideas conception stage as well then the, the project will be all the more valuable and the engineering rather than rather than just being a kind of cost you know to kind of get the thing over the line um, 
yeah, you know, there's a real value. There's a real value in it, in it as well yeah. as as a cost when when that can be you know facilitated on a project. How how do you go about communicating what you're doing as not a cost but more as 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 a value? Because this is a conversation that obviously happens a lot in, yeah. in architectural practice quite a bit. Mm. How do we how do we communicate value? And it, is it a similar sort of not not obstacle but a challenge or a thing that needs to be communicated to to clients yeah well you use the word communicate there a couple of times and i think i think that's that's what it is all about is kind of communicating the the design the design communication which is to do with not just explaining the solution or a solution but also how you got there you know sometimes you have to kind of consider six different ideas just to know that it's the seventh detail or shape or whatever um, which is the the white one you know um, and so explaining the kind of the I could say the wrong solutions but the solutions that you didn't take up explaining what they were and why you didn't go for them um, is every bit as important as explaining the final bit and I think that's the real kind of value in the kind of design led engineering right approach I think that you kind of like I'm explaining your thinking and you have the tools at your disposal to be able to do that not just verbally but visually yeah hand sketching there's a lot of hand sketching and physical model building which is going on in our studio um, I would like there to be more um, uh, uh, but there's probably more than, than, than many engineering practices and um, I think I think that that's really to our strength. And if you look at, for example, the way architects are designing, um, they're also in charge of their own drawings. Very often in engineering practices, there's a kind of a divorce between somebody who's cadding something up and someone who's kind of doing the calculations, a kind of old school kind of right, okay. separation. So, that, so those roles can actually be more quite clearly defined in a, in a traditional sense? Or? Often they are, and we're trying to actually bring them back together again with kind of hand sketching and, um, you know, modelling techniques for all our engineers and mm. our team members not to have... It. And with that, I think, really, you once you're drawing and you're holding the pen, yeah, and then you can... Uh, take much more charge, much you know, real charge of the kind of the, the decisions and the and the, and the design decisions that go into making up a any particular solution. Yeah, so it's kind of communicating that the, the fact that you're doing an iterative process hmm. and that those iterations, you know, a client or somebody might not actually see all those different iterations. Yes. And here's the final solution, but yes. you've also got to be able to explain how you got there. Yeah, how you got there, and. Who, how do you um, typically structure your relationship with, say, the end client? Hmm. So, for example, with an architect, it's kind of, in the traditional sense, we're typically employed by the client right hmm. in the early stage, and, you know, in a, the traditional contract would have us in that relationship right the way through to yeah. completion. More modern contracts, we might get innovated to a contractor at some point, and we lose that... Uh, initial first contact or closeness mm. with the with the uh, client. How do you prefer to be employed in a design consultant team? What what works best, or what are the different sort of relationships that can exist? Well, yeah, there's a vast uh, array of of relationships. I mean, I think more often than not, we're employed direct by the client. Um, yet a lot of the work we're doing is with the architect um, so well I mean we're always prepared and enjoy uh, actually coming along to those meetings and presentations or whatever it is to explain what it is that we've been doing yeah um, because I guess engineering can be a bit kind of you know black box sometimes and people don't really understand why you've made that decision, yeah. you know, um, or why it is the way it is. And that's quite dangerous sometimes, you know, because, you, you know, if for whatever reason later on that a particular decision about a way of doing things has started to get unpicked, you know, um, if people don't feel they're actually 
responsible for that decision or understand why it was made. You know, that's you know, that's not. Uh, I don't think that's always always that healthy. So it's nice to be yeah, it's it's important to be able to explain why it is why it's steel, why it's concrete, why it's timber, why it's a, a shell structure and not a traditional you know yeah. beam spanning from A to B or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, you know to explain that and that also how that then also how that kind of um, you know fits into what the clients trying to do. Yeah, we're good. It's, it's it's interesting. The some aspects of what you do as an engineer, you know, like a foundations or whatever, that might never get actually seen mm. by a client, and it can be a significant uh, cost. And you know, in that, and also you don't want to go into you don't want to go into all the maths and all the all the details necessarily of why it needs no. to be a certain way. Yeah. So do you find that you have a there's an art to being able to you know know how much information to give? There is. There is, yes. You obviously there has to be a, I talked about, you know basic trust and respect. So, yeah. you know, it's not that one has to constantly kind of um, explain every single micro decision you've made, um, but you mentioned foundations, and that is something unseen, but costs a lot of money. And um, so, to, to be able to explain why it's piled or screw piled or a raft or some other innovative, another innovative tech, whatever it is, um, you know, to be able to explain why it is that way is, uh, and visually, you know, so we'll talk about the visual nature of our work and that also comes back to the visual nature of explaining our design decisions, not to kind of couch it up in kind of sophisticated models or calculations, but also mm. just in simple, very simple terms as to why, what the soil strata is, yeah. where the anchor or the screw pile or whatever, it, what, what it's actually doing, you know, just simple kind of visuals yes. um, to explain to the client or whoever um, where their money's going. Yes, yeah. yeah. It, it, it's, you know, the same thing with, with architects, you know, we don't want to be going overly into unnecessary detail about yeah. why decisions have been uh, made the way they have, but also it's important to be very, there is, this an art, there's a skill in being able to be clear and communicate with clarity over yeah. why something, what the process is, why it needs to be like this. Mm. And I guess different clients are going to be, have different levels of interest. Yeah, yeah, they are. Yeah, some people don't mind you know, as long as it works. Other people are really into it, into a particular kind of joint that you've developed and which is similar to comes maybe from a, the furniture industry or yeah or whatever it is um so yeah there is different, different I, I, was about, I had uh, so it's inter- I've, I've worked with engineers as consultants like collaboratively mm. i've also had clients who are engineers oh yeah and that was really interesting because the the client was a railway engineer ah and i might have told you about this guy before maybe yeah. he's he's brilliant but he's he loves detail like mm. i need to communicate with him in a way where it is extremely detailed to the point of it being a little bit unnecessary wow yeah at, at points but and i remember him telling me how he'd you know he'd gone through four architects before we started working together yeah and i didn't realize i didn't find this out until you know a few years of working with him mm. And and it was it was interesting just because there was a there was a different way of communicating where he was very like for him it was so important to ensure that we spoke about millimeters mm. on every level and that everything was exactly yeah. right. Whereas for me, I was like, well, these are planning drawings. Like, so yeah. So, did you like that level of kind of interest, or was it kind of I, I, difficult to? I I think once. Once I knew that was what worked yeah. with him, then we found a we found a way of communicating, and I structured a way of you know any additional questions or information mm. I'd stick an hourly rate on it as well. Uh, so yeah. that 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 filtered out a, lum- a number yes. of questions. Yes, and this is actually something that I've seen or noticed from engineers is that you know in architecture we talk about fees a lot, and you know we kind of it's common mm. commonplace now to do lump sum fees. Yeah, whereas. It, a lot of engineers I've worked with are a lot more, as an industry, and I might be wrong here, but they're a lot more kind of 
protective or intelligent in a way with keeping an hourly rate keeping mm. you know keeping very close eye on what's being done on a client on a, on a project mm. and being able to bill effectively for it whereas and again as I say this I might be totally mm. making this up but I do uh, see with many architects that, that that conversation can be let go of and there's lots of work being done for free right, I know yeah. how easy it is as yeah, well when you yeah. is that something that you've experienced or how do you kind of keep controls over your charges well it's difficult I mean we tend to be very transparent and open book about it um, what we don't want to do is take on something that we don't properly understand yet or is maybe not fully defined um, for like a fixed fee with no you know no, no way of knowing whether it's cheap or not because I don't think that's actually what clients really want you know because if you run out of fee and you're struggling to answer the site queries or um, reconsider a particular detail which somebody who's come into the project wants to do differently yeah. and you're saying sorry can't can't help you with that um, that's quite frustrating I think yeah. um, and uh, so there needs to be some so there needs to be some flexibility in the changing scope um, sometimes though it, it is simple people do know what they want and you kind of know what the solution is and you can give a just a fixed fee for doing that um, yeah I mean I do it differently for different people depending on how they want it um, on how we can agree on having it um, I mean sometimes more of a kind of shopping list mm. approach is, is is good so that people aren't getting sold things that they don't necessarily want or value some level of 3D modelling or for, for instance which is yeah. kind of nice to have but not absolutely essential but on the other hand sometimes that is really important for a project if it's a you know, prefabricated CLT kind of panelised kind of kit of parts you know you mm. really need to you do you will need that you know at some stage and um so to actually kind of list those things out what it is you're doing what the fee is for doing it yeah at the outset kind of shopping list approach is is very valuable um or sometimes it's just a question of look this is the kind of minimum that you would need to get this thing approval and on the site and other times it's kind of like well but there is an opportunity here to kind of do something special or yeah. different or extra and that might be for this amount of money um, so then it gives the client or the architect the team the choice about what they actually what it is they actually want to do mm. um, so just understanding that not in a similar way to building a building you don't want to kind of the thing to be built and you don't understand how it's working you don't really want to design a project yeah. um, where something is fixed when you don't really understand yeah. what it might turn into yeah or how it can kind of unfold into all sorts of different tasks and yeah. pieces to it and, yeah, whatever kind of unknown complexity that there is hidden beneath the structural fabric exactly yeah. how, how do you because a lot of the work that you do um, you know it's, it was talking about earlier that sort of pioneering in terms of energy like mm. passive, passive house yeah. um, sustainability mm. um, working with timber and innovative use of, of wood mm. how do you bring those agendas into projects and are they, is mm. it something that the client is looking for or is it something that you say this is what this is what should be done. Or is it something the architect is driving? Well, um, I guess this come, uh, we we do have a as a practice, perhaps unusually, a, a kind of manifesto, right, um, of things that we are striving for. And you know, it's important that we do something not just for someone else, but also for ourselves. Um, don't, you know, in terms of what we get satisfaction kind of what we're doing, um, and. We our manifesto we call it affectionately known as the, the three E's, which is um, economy, efficiency, and elegance. So, 
come to, onto the economy one, um, not, we just being kind of monetarily kind of af- affordable, but th- that is important. Mm. Um, but also, can the you know the, can the environment afford it? Um, and um, so the whole sustainability and gender. I mean, it's sustainability is such a yeah, much used word, meaning all sorts of things to different people, and it's difficult to find somebody or an organisation who doesn't think of themselves as sustainable. Yeah. Um, but I mean, we we really do care about it, and it is something that kind of motivates us, has motivated me mm. right from my early years, as a you know, way before I was an engineer. And so it is important to me. So I mean, very, very often people do come to us for that um, uh, because they they know that and other times it's something we can introduce Um, so we can all you know it's it's amazing uh, even project you think is going to be a certain type of project and then you know the people on it the the client whoever you can discover all these other aspirations Mm. that they have and sustainability and gender does kind of strike a chord with a lot of people and I guess what we where we kind of see it in terms of a kind of um, you know a practice and um, it's not just in terms of what material is it made of um, but you mentioned passive house also like which is a kind of very kind of detailing question yeah. it's, it's certain, a certain amount to do with form but also really to do with the detailing and that kind of thoroughness and intricate nature of the of the detailing through the through the thermal the uh, through the kind of external envelope um, but also in terms of um, what's the kind of structural form you know because different ways of spanning a room whether it's an arch a vault um, or a beam yeah. will have a different um, volume of material associated with it because arches and catenaries and shells are so much more structurally efficient than a simply supported beam you know so in terms of the, the form as well I think they, in terms of driving down the um, you know, the kilograms of CO2 per square meter is very important the bigger the structure the, the more important it is really and, and does this rational I mean engin- engineering for example often we think of it as being a much more like a very rational language, a very rational discipline. Mm. Does that rational approach and that efficiency always translate into cost efficiencies, for example? Or, or Not always, but it, it can do, and it really should do. Um, uh, I think it maybe is more and more. Um, I guess if you look at it in terms of the economics, it, you, know, you go to some parts of the world and some parts of history when the value of materials and the value of um, you know people um, depending on that kind of matrix it's uh, all that kind of equation Mm -hmm. um, then the material efficiency becomes more and more important if you look at just after the Second World War, when there was a material shortage, it was really amazing. And during the Second World War, real amazing structural forms emerging at that period of history. And um, that's because that's all that could be afforded, you know, because material costs were so high. Um, but it can do, and it should do, and uh, often it does, I think. Do, do, do you find that you're often in a, in a conversation with clients where they are wanting to know the impact of... Uh, you know the cost impact of certain solutions mm. over other solutions. Oh yeah, all, all the time. I think really, and um, you. I guess it's important to understand also what the client's relationship is to their their project, whether they're yeah. the, the end user or not. Um, very often, if they are, then they will see. You know, for example, thermal efficiency of the building. You know, might a bit more to um, build that in in the first place but then they might see it in their uh, bills energy bills coming down over over time so it is very important to, that they also that they realize that they have a choice you know that it yeah. doesn't have to just be kind of minimum building regs new values but they can also do um, you know, passive house levels yeah. or, or somewhere yeah. in between, you know, and uh, they don't just have to go with, yeah, yeah. minimum standards, I think. Um, 
How has your role changed since yeah. being just you and David yeah. to now, you know, running a, a, a significantly larger team? What have been yeah. what, have, what have been the sort of the skills that you've had to learn or the challenges yeah. that you've you've faced? Good question. Um, I think uh, we kind of mentioned at the beginning you know, how how simple can we make it if we really strip it back you know because we come from a larger practice background um we've you know we first started out you know all the you know all the fees that we were charging were being spent on design time rather than and very kind of low overheads yeah um and we were you know doing all the work um i mean now i am still very hands-on yeah um and uh and i like it that way yes like being at the kind of the cold face, so to speak. Um, um, but you cannot have all your attention drawn on that for all sorts of reasons. It's exactly healthy for the team, generally, yeah. for people. Um, certainly not healthy for the kind of, in terms of, you need, we need to have an eye on the horizon as to what's coming up next, you mm. know. And if you're too kind of focused on the kind of day to day, it's difficult to maintain that. Um, longer term view of things. I found that if you are, if I am too involved on you know, on on the kind of day to day kind of project um, issues, that you there's a kind of a certain amount of work that kind of comes in on the tide, you know, washes in on the tide, and um, uh, which is which is great, which is which is fine. But if you want to have a kind of Maintain some kind of control about what it is that you're doing. Yeah, um, you need to specifically, intentionally seek out opportunities, form those ties with people where those opportunities might come from. Yeah, um, and so yes, yeah, so I'm more kind of distant than I used to be, but I still really enjoy the. The, 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 the nitty gritty, exactly. Yeah. And and what what sorts of relationships are important for you as you know to to, to finding work? Is mm. it something that you, do you go and liaise direct with with clients or or are architects? You know, a good a good sort. Like because mm. for for an architect, for example, there's all sorts of different referral partners. Let's call it. You know, right, like yeah. a, a sort of you know a, a part of a power team, if you like, mm. to use this kind of uh, corporate terminology of you know, an estate agent might be a good person to get work work from for, yeah. for an architect, right. um, or a contractor, obviously that's the classic oh, one, yeah. or, a, or a developer yeah. as well. As an um, as an engineer, who are the sorts of key mm. figures that you find are very useful to be networking with, or that yeah. you go out and actively seek to speak to that's a good question i mean i think well our relationships and our kind of key contacts they are there is a big variety of ultimate clients contractors yeah. developers specialist fabricators as well right. you know, people who are uh, in the timber in the timber world um, um i guess because just because of the nature of the way a project floats down the stream um, most of our kind of leads do come via our architect friends mm. um, and uh, so that is that's been the kind of the richest um, kind of vein if you like um, and that has led on to lots of lots of other relationships and projects but um, I think because of the type of you know people we are um, that that's a yeah. That's 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 a, that's a very uh, uh, yeah. That, that, that's a good stream of work. Great. Yeah. And what have you got planned for twenty twenty? Wow, good question. Um, I well, got a very exciting little a um, well, couple of little uh, pavilions at the Chelsea Flower Show. Um, oh, is it the, this year, I think they're behind us. Little models that we've been building uh, some lattice structures with a. Um, yeah, uh, uh, very nice, uh, very good landscape architect, uh, Sam Lovins, and a, a Cornish timber fabricator. Um, yeah, um, we're working with a 
uh, monastery group just outside of London um, on a uh, yeah, much larger project. Um, we've got great aspirations in terms mm. of sustainability, in terms of legible structural form on a, on a real scale, really, which is uh, which is very exciting. Um, as well as um, you know, equally valuable, um, you know, solving UK's housing crisis, building by building, apartment block by apartment block. There's a there's a few of those. Um, coming up as well so yeah it's all it's going to be an exciting year I think excellent brilliant Peter thank you so much for your time today thank you Ryan excellent and that's a wrap and don't forget if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom fulfilment and profit please visit smartpracticemethod.com or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly follow the link in the information The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.